I want to point out is I haven't done anything particularly value oriented here. I have on the horizontal axis talked about the value in terms of the economic return. And on the vertical axis, there's the, there's the biological objective. And it is measured in biological terms. I have not put that into dollars. Okay. Well, you know, then, then you could ask, well, where do I want, you know, supposing I want to be, you know, somewhere out there rather than at point I, but where do I want to be? Do I want to be at point F or G or D or what? And that, okay. Um, and that depends upon your relative preferences. So, you know, you, you could have economists or somebody or society politicians say, well, which of these objectives is really more important? And that will tell you where you would end up on this, on this line or where on this frontier. Okay. Um, let me go now to, if I can, uh, the, uh, let's go more to ecosystem services. And, um, so the last one was just biodiversity conservation and kind of commodity value. But what about um, what about water quality and carbon sequestration? Let's add those into the mix. And here, what we did was we actually uh, built off of an existing uh, research consortium that had done a futuring exercise and, and talked to people in the basin about well, what what do you think will happen in the basin and, and have them do various scenarios, so a business as usual, or conservation-oriented, or development-oriented. And these are the maps, and actually for our purposes it was wonderful. They had spatially explicit maps every decade from 1990 up to 2050. I've just shown you the 2050 uh, maps here. We evaluated these now with the invest model, and so we're doing carbon and uh, phosphorus uh, reduction. That's what water quality stands for here, is actually it's phosphorus. Um, flooding, uh, the same kind of agriculture, uh, timber, and housing values for market values. And we evaluated them under these three plans. Now, the point I want to make with this one is the following. If we do kind of classic what's valued in the market right now, that's the, that's the circles. And if we, so just like the last one we did, you know, here's the you know, economic value, if you will, or market value, and then the vertical is the biodiversity score. And you know we get this sort of classic trade-off pattern, right? If you want conservation, you got to give up something in terms of the economic returns. However, let's think about on this over here. What if we actually could give people or pay people for ecosystem services? What if their values were actually reflected? And that's what the, the triangle does here. Actually, just for one service, just carbon. Okay. And so now we don't get a trade-off. It's like in the landowner's interest to do actions which are more oriented towards the conservation scenario than the others because they're providing a public good for which now they are getting some credit for. So the set of institutions that you have and the set of things that people care about or respond to really matter here. Okay, and I think I'm getting close to time. So I think I'm going to skip over this one and get kind of to the last one because I want to have some uh, Conclusions here. So actually, I'll just say this last one I want to talk about is in the state of Minnesota. So you know, maybe the Willamette Basin is just some weird place. And for those of you who've been out there, it is pretty weird for the U.S., but um, it's a very nice part of the part of the world. Minnesota, heartland. Okay. So what happens here? And um, so what we did was we looked at actual land use change pattern from 1992 to 2001, and, all, and some alternatives. Okay. And um, so the question is, you know. How well did we do, or what happened with the actual land use pattern, and could we have done better? Um, so again, we evaluated things in terms of carbon and under these alternative scenarios. Okay, you can see, for example, one of them does really poorly. If we expand agriculture and plow up lots of new land, we let a lot of carbon go. Uh, phosphorus exports, uh, breeding birds, grassland breeding birds, and actually here the pattern is that there's actually new pasture. Um, you know, we've got fewer forests and more pasture. That's actually good for grassland breeding birds, but very bad for forest birds. Right? So even you know, when we talk about trade-offs, it's not always economic return versus environment or biodiversity. Obviously, there are trade-offs among uh, within biodiversity and within ecosystem services. Um, and then economics, so agriculture, forestry, uh, and urban. And I just want to show you this last kind of how do we summarize this. And this is not, you know, so previously I summarized things in terms of maps, which are very good visually. This is more in terms of, okay, what's the bottom line? And the bottom line here for the landowners is, well, what do I get?
paid for right now. And so they would be looking at this bottom line, whereas more of a societal viewpoint, including some of the value ecosystem services, and here we were doing value of water quality improvements and value of uh, carbon. And now what you get is you get a very different choice by society, or very different ranking among these alternatives, if you include value of clean water, value of carbon. I mean, I think, again, I think we know this, the importance of these things, but having this kind of, believe me, having this kind of demonstration and say, we've done careful analysis, and we can show you that, you know, this mineral agricultural expansion actually is preferable on a societal point of view. Okay, so to, to summarize, spatially explicit analysis of multiple ecosystem services and biodiversity conservation, we can show the joint provision and trade-offs or synergies among different outcomes. So there's one landscape, we have one earth, but there's many outcomes or consequences that we care about. So what are the trade-offs among these things? And how, in order to answer that question, we really need to do both the kind of ecology and other uh, natural sciences to understand the provision and how things change. The social science, including economics, about how important is this, how does this relate to people's lives or well-being. And then thinking about on the ground policies and scenarios and what actually happens and how do you have to make things or how to change policy in order to get things happening on the ground that truly reflect values. Um, and we can see that the failure to do this leads oftentimes to very poor outcomes, both in terms of the level of services, the level of well-being, and the environmental outcomes. All right, I want to kind of try to end with a couple of challenges. Where are we? thinking about going forward, what are the next steps? So one is thinking about, uh, on the provisioning, or how well do we understand these social ecological systems? Um, they're dynamic, they're interconnected. And so do we understand both the long, short-term and long-term consequences of management actions well enough to, to, to manage wisely? And a particular challenge here, and, and uh, I know a number of people in the room, and uh, uh, based sometimes in Stockholm, and clearly people at the Resilience Center, this is a, a major focus, is thinking about, you know, how do we think about systems which may have very complex dynamics and may exhibit uh, crossing of thresholds? How do we take that into account ahead of time? Do we know enough, for example, to avoid crossing dangerous thresholds? In terms of the evaluation side, so I've been talking to a number of people over the last few days about how much it's change between economics and ecology, how, how much easier it is for economists and ecologists to talk. One thing which has not changed as much or as fast as many of us would like is getting the rest of the social sciences to be able to talk as easily as now at least some economists and ecologists talk. So it shows up here, thinking about the importance of cultural, spiritual, and aesthetic values, or, you know, of, of cultural, social norms. How do we actually bring that into the analysis in a, in a, in a way that's an equal part? I think that's still a challenge. Um, I'll skip over this. It's an interesting story. You can ask me about it. But uh, the, the thing I think is really fun, you know, it's, it's tough. They're as interesting as the science aspects are, both social and natural. The implementation questions, really getting things onto the ground, which really means not just doing an aggregate, and I've been guilty of it here, doing an aggregate uh, total benefit kind of thing, but who benefits? And who's costs? And how do we think about that? And that's what politics get. I mean, so you might do something where 99% of the population is advanced, but if there's a very powerful 1% who can block things, that's a problem. So we need to think much more about how is this actually going to play out, and who's going to be promoting things, and how does it actually get done? And of course, we've got, we have to learn through time. We're not going to get this right the first time. So hopefully, we don't cross irreversible thresholds, but we design institutions that learn. We can adapt to, to new information. And let me leave you with one last thought. I, I kind of dodged this at the beginning, but what is the objective? So many people, and you know, if you talk to social scientists in particular, it's, it's human well-being is the bottom line. And, uh, if they're thinking in terms of environmental terms or long term, it's sustaining human well-being over the course of the, of the long term. But maybe it's biodiversity for its own sake. I mean, there's certainly uh, a, a number of, you know, within the conservation organizations, that's a very strong opinion. And within, 
within the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. That was a tension between those who thought that the end goal here was human well-being and those who thought biodiversity conservation for its own sake uh, is, is really an important end. Of course, most of us have perhaps some of both. Um, it's not, again, an either or necessarily. Um, and some of these issues, uh, just uh, plug for Belinda Ryers, and, uh, as a co-author of this paper, it's coming on bioscience, talking about some of the tension between ecosystem service and biodiversity conservation. Um, and it's really interesting thinking of means versus ends. Okay, so ends are your objective, and means are your ways to get to uh, those ends. So, you know, one could say, oh, I'm interested in biodiversity conservation because human well-being depends upon it, right? It's essential as a means to the end of human well-being. And that, in a way, is really where ecosystem services come in, right? So nature is important because of the services it provides in promoting human well-being. But you could also embrace ecosystem services because it expands the support that you get for biodiversity conservation. So in one of the sessions this morning, I was talking about water funds. Water funds in South America use funds from uh, water users to promote conservation in watersheds um, which, which is very good for biodiversity, and it's also good for downstream water users. So, an interesting juxtaposition of, of means and ends. Anyway, moving ahead, you know, it is daunting in this area, because you have to know a lot, right? We have to know natural science, social science, implementation, and try to pull this together. And we clearly don't know enough, but in a way, being so poor at doing this now, the bar is so low, that we certainly know enough to improve upon current performance, okay? Uh, so there's really a pressing need to do what TEAB is trying to do, to mainstream the value of nature into societal decisions, and patience, right? You have to keep pushing, keep going, uh, keep the momentum up, the better science, better institutions, and an adaptive process that turns to time. Thank you very much.